Hey everyone, my name is Matt. Welcome back to our home renovation remodel edition thing with Bopper, whatever we're calling it. This time we are gonna take a pretty good step forward in transforming this blank space into something that looks like maybe something finished or at least get pretty close to it. So we're going to be making the flooring, which would be going in here. If you missed the last episode, I did all of the uh, initial selection and rough, I guess, select cutting of a giant stack of white oak to select a bunch of rifts on boards. So we'll have some nice rifts on white oak flooring in here. Those boards are all still rough on. They have been dried. And this time we will be milling all that into actual flooring, which can be installed in here. And here's that pile of boards from last time, which will be machining into tongue and groove flooring. And this is the machine we're going to use to do this. I got this uh, four-sided molder for my buddies, Matt and Andy. They got this thing, uh, you know, I don't know, like six months ago or something. They haven't had a chance to use it for real. They just ran a couple of test boards through it. So I will be uh, basically using it for the first time <laughs> and figuring out how to use it. Uh, but it has four heads. So you have this cutter head here, which is on the bottom. This will cut the bottom of the board you have a spindle here this one's already got the uh the tongue knife in there so this first knife cuts the tongue on this side this spindle here will cut the groove and then as it exits us here there's another cutter head up here which will play in the top of the board and if you kind of look this way you can see the uh the fence here this is really like the reference of the entire process so whatever ends up against this fence here is uh how the board will go through so you want a nice straight edge on here on the bigger machines, you might be able to get away with a little less of a straight edge to start with, but to get nice straight boards, which close up really nicely in the install, you want to make sure that the uh, your reference edge is nice and straight and perfect as it goes into the machine. So I will be going through and uh, edging all these boards to give them a nice straight edge. One of the questions on the last video was on uh, ripping all these at the table saw. If I had edge jointed them at all, and uh, I did not. So I took the rough sawn edge right off the sawmill. A little bit of snow falling off the roof. <laughs> so rough sawn edge off the sawmill, and I just threw it through the table saw to rip these to a rough width. I have two widths in here. I have six and three eighths rough, and like four and a half rough. They should finish at like almost six probably, and four and mixing in the fours with the sixes will allow me to use more of the material. And a lot of the times, if you mix them in randomly enough, you can't really tell that there's a narrow row, you know, wherever that might be in the overall field of the entire floor. So it's a good way to use, you know, some extra material without just having a bunch of, uh, a bunch of waste. So I am going to get working on this pile, get them all edged and uh, at least get that stage finished up. And while I'm doing that, I'm also going to read the manual for this <laughs> and uh, calibrate it and set it up a little bit. Like I said, Matt and Andy haven't really used it at all. So I'm gonna go through as if it wasn't used at all and make sure all the cutter heads are aligned to the tables. And basically I'll do the whole setup process as you would do if you had just got this thing uh, from the manufacturer. So I'm starting with the narrower stuff. Part of what I'm doing is, is uh, working towards sorting the narrow boards from the wider boards which kind of got mixed up through the drawing process. But I wanted to show you one little trick here, I guess. So I don't necessarily need all these boards to be the full eight foot long. I need to have some shorter pieces for the install. And as I'm working through this pile, I'm taking note of the, uh, the boards looking for any significant crown. So this one here has got a really good bow in it. So you can see if I were to straighten this out, I would lose a half inch on this side and then I lose another half inch on the other side. So I end up losing an inch of material. If I were to straighten this, 
the quickest and easiest way to straighten a board is uh, with a saw. So this one, we'll boop, cut that one in half. We'll have two four footers and we'll have almost probably a very small amount of material removed during this first straightening. So now as you see me working through the rest of the stack, I'll be chopping some pieces as we go, making small pieces for the install. And um, I do have some other small pieces because we're gonna need a bunch of test boards as you work towards setting up that machine. So I have a few extra wide boards in here that are just kind of extras. And there is the full width boards and these are the uh, narrow width boards. So we'll have at least two different runs of widths, probably more like three or four different widths that will run. So that's all of the rough stock kind of ready to go. Now to uh, figure out how to work uh, this thing. So let me, uh, let me run you through this machine and how you set it up because there is quite a lot going on here and I still don't quite know what I'm doing. <laughs> so we'll start here on this end. So over here we have essentially a jointer. So this is, you know, a cutter head. It's got four uh, slots in it. So right now I have a knife loaded in this side and then 180 degrees from it is another knife. It has the other two slots here where you can install either another pair of knives or you can use the molding cutters in this cutter head as well. So because we're making flooring and I want some bottom relief cutters, the, uh, the groove here will be used for the relief cutters. So we'll have a two knife cutter head on this end. The way this end of things kind of works here is we have a table and we have a step in the table. So you can see this fin here and this fin over here. These are actually at an offset from each other and you set the depth of cut using these uh, filler pieces. So the more of these shims you install, the less material is going to be removed. And I believe the maximum depth of cut, if you take this shim out, would be two millimeters. But the first thing I have to do is set the, uh, the blade heights to the correct height. So we want these to be parallel with the top of the table here. 
So you can use a straight edge or a square or whatever, and you can rotate the knife until it just kisses that thing. I have this uh, dial indicator knife setup tool thing. So you can zero it out on a table and then bring the plunger over top of the knife and you can roll the knife through there and raise or lower the knife until it actually zeroes out with the table. You can see the knife is too low still. So the cutter head has these jack screws which engage with a little slot in the knife. So this is the slot in the knives. So there is a little screw head that's kind of engaged in there. So when you uh, turn it in or out, it will raise or lower the knife, which uh, is kind of slick. So with the, um, the plunger now on top of that knife, I can adjust that screw to bring that knife up so it's level with the bed. Okay, let me do the other side. Okay, so those two knives are set up in this head and we'll drop the back cutters in in a little while. I am waiting on another set of these to come in, so we'll do that later. They're supposed to come today. I wanna work on the top cutter, so I have the additional knives and gibs to put in. So I have a four knife cutter head back here and we also need to check the cutter head to make sure it's parallel to the table. So I think I'm gonna do that first. And we should be able to do that with, uh, with this thing again. So the dial is reading at 32 on this side. We'll spin it around and see what it reads on the, uh, the other end of the cutter head. So according to the dial indicator, this side of the cutter head is about uh, 11 thou too high. So it's in here kind of like this, <laughs> this kind of goofy angle. So I need to loosen up these uh, mounting bolts here and drop the... Uh, Drop this side down a little bit. I think I'm gonna call that good enough. It's about, mm, right there is even with the other side. We go up almost two thou. I think two thou is just fine. So I'm gonna tighten this back up and then we can do the, the knives. So I'm getting ready to install the extra knives in the cutter head and I realized that I don't have a piece that I actually need. I need the knife height adjustment screws. These things are the ones that grip into those uh, slots in the knives and allow you to push them up and down to level them with the cutter head. Um, I don't have any more of these screws like in the accessory bags of hardware and everything that I have. So I just ordered a few more of these. Whenever they come in, we can install the extra knives. So I'm just gonna kind of sidetrack this for now or put it on the back burner. This is kind of how this whole thing's been going so far. It's been like, I've been out here trying to set the machine up and I'm missing something or I need something. And I'm waiting for something to come in. That's, uh, that's the gist of how this has been going. This machine's been in here for uh, like two or three weeks already. <laughs> Okay, through the magic of time travel, I have the screws I need to finish installing those cutters. So we'll grab the, the knives and we'll get these actually set and installed. And then we'll look at the side cutters, which I was all prepared to start talking about. Okay, so we got the jack screws and we'll get these kind of roughly where the other ones are, just protruding a little past the cutter head, and then we'll snug up the, uh, the gib bolts, which I can't get to. So this is the knife setting jig they provide, so you're supposed to put this over the center of the knife, and this will tell you if the knife is at the right height for the depth of cut it's supposed to take. So the way that I've been doing this is I set the knife high to begin with so that the setting gauge thing rocks and then I'll lower the knife down until it stops rocking. Okay, so that one's good. 
I can actually snug these down. It's like it's like kind of backwards. You loosen it to make it tighter. Those don't want to be like super ridiculously tight. And the other thing they say to do is just to bring these back down and snug them up. And uh, that's it. Now this cutter head has, well, this actually spins this way. <laughs> this now has four knives in it instead of the stock two. So let's, uh, let's move on to the, the side cutters. It's basically just two uh, shaper spindles. So the spindles are 25 millimeters. So if you have any like shaper cutters that might be a 25 millimeter bore, you know, you could, you could run them on here. So these are the indexed, I guess, molding knife cutter head things. But if you want to do just like a S4S operation where you just want to do like a squaring up the edges thing, you can get a spindle that's like a helical insert that just slides on there and you can bolt that in place. So for these things, so first off, I guess <laughs> these are the tie and groove knives that come with the uh, the knife set from Woodmiser. So as I was uh, kind of doing my initial look through this machine, familiarizing myself with it, I noticed that the knives that they had received or they had run in here already, they had sheared off one of the groove cutters. So I would need to order new uh, tie and groove knives anyway. So I ordered the, uh, I guess the more advanced set it has a whole bunch of different things in here that we can use to make all kinds of different things in the future. But I figured while I was waiting, I would actually order some actual flooring knives. They're tongue groove knives actually made for flooring. Because these ones here, they just cut tongue and groove, which is okay, but it's not like the best for flooring. So if we take a look at this picture here, you can see you just have a groove on one side and a tongue on the other side, and there's nothing really, uh, there's nothing else really going on. The problem is, is if you have like a little bit of smutch or something down here on the floor or whatever, and then you slide your next piece in there, you're gonna end up with a gap up top and your top seam that actually matters will not close. So the last time when I made flooring, what I did is I cut this shoulder back further and that would ensure that the top seam would bottom out and be tight every single time. The other thing this doesn't have, which is less of a big deal, is a nail slot. So in actual flooring, there's a little slot here along a tongue to give a spot for the nail head to actually go. That way, it's not a huge deal because the pneumatic nailers tend to sit the nail heads low enough where it's not a big deal. But if you had any kind of issues with that, you wouldn't have to worry about using a nail set to go back and just make sure your nail heads aren't uh, protruding. So these are the flooring knives, the flooring tongue groove cutters that I ordered. And it is uh, I this, this profile here. So we have a little nail slot in there and we also have a crap catch <laughs> down in here. So if there's any kind of junk or anything laying on the floor uh, as you side these two pieces together, this will give a place for some junk to go and not prevent this top seam from closing up completely. So these things are all indexed. They have these little studs in here. So you can just simply pop in your knife. It's all indexed exactly the same place with those index holes. And then there is a wedge that you can slide in to lock the knife in place. So that is sort of the easy part. The more difficult and potentially annoying part about this is setting the height. So it's not a huge deal if you're only doing something on one edge that's not referential on the other edge, for instance. But in this case, since we're doing flooring, these have to be set exactly right so that the tongue and grooves actually seat fully and the top ends up flush. So that is actually done with all shims. So that'll be a, that'll be a fun little thing. So they have different maybe larger ones and then there are some really thin ones that I have as well. So those set the final height for the spindle and uh, that's gonna be a, a pretty good amount of trial and error. So we'll have to get them set roughly in the right place and then we can go back and uh, run some test pieces when we get there and we'll end up fine tuning the height of uh, either of these to get that tongue and groove to actually line up nice and perfectly. So now the fun part of getting these things set up right. So 
I want my groove to be a quarter inch off the bottom of the flooring. So I have this straight edge here, which is a quarter inch thick. And that's where I want the, uh, the tongue here to actually start. So that's actually pretty darn close right there. So in theory, put those on there, these on here. This can drop on here. This one here can drop on here. And actually doing it on this side is a little bit easier because I can actually put the uh, the straight edge underneath the cutter and it is these are a little low. So if I pull this out, that will drop down. So I need to come up a little bit. So let's try this, which is, I don't know, 16th or something. So I think that's gonna be pretty darn good enough close. It's a little bit high, but as long as the other side matches, the actual dimension on the bottom side doesn't matter a whole lot. I just want it to be around a quarter inch. Let me throw the matching spacer on this side and that'll be our starting point for calibration. These are the nuts that lock the uh, cutter heads in place and you have to shim up the rest of the spindle to get up to the thread height. So let's do go there. And then now we can, one of them is reverse thread, and this is reverse thread. Yep. Okay, tighten that down. Okay. Right around there, that's pretty close. So now if you look over here, you can see this straight edge extends this fence. And out here you can see how much material this fence here is set up to remove. So this cutter head is going to remove whatever this distance is here. Since I already jointed the edge, I don't need to remove much of any material. So I'm going to move this one uh, to maybe like a 16th or something from the straight edge because that's practically all that you need to remove to actually square up the board. It's already straight, it's just not square. Let's do that. That was a good one. We're getting closer. <laughs> okay, the last thing on the list should be the back cutters. I wanted to wait till now so I knew where this fence was going to be so I could you know, lay out my flooring and make sure that these back cutters are going to be somewhere in the flooring. Uh, I think I'm, I'll probably have to just do one back cutter when we get to the, uh, the narrower stuff. But at least for now, for the we'll set up for the six inch wide stuff or whatever the wider stuff ends up being, probably like five and three quarters or something. So we'll set up these cutters for that. So the cutters are exactly the same as the ones that would go into the uh, the side spindles. They just have these little gibs here, which use the same index holes, and then these things just drop into the uh, the slot here in the cutter head. So there is one set. So I'll do two sets and we'll set the spacing here and then we'll do the same thing to the, the opposite side of the cutter head and install a pair of back cutters over there in the exact same orientation. And you can use these lines here in the cutter head to make sure that these are lined up from, you know, from 180 degrees from each other. So I'll put one here around one inch from the edge and then we'll have one kind of here-ish so we have 
basically we're an inch from each edge and then this is just some makeup space in the middle which is I don't know three quarters or something I don't really know these are not important <laughs> like compared to everything else we're doing these are like the least important thing that uh, we'll do because their actual exact placement is completely irrelevant because they're not interfacing with anything else they're just there to make those relief cuts. So now the last thing I need, all besides setting the actual width of the, of the cut, is gonna be the table height. So that'll be the final thickness of the board. Uh, when I installed this uh, table here, you can't really get to this bolt with this bolt here. So my uh, little indicator thing is off. <laughs> so to, uh, to get my at least my initial rough height, I got a couple blocks up in there. Those are some magnetic shims, and that'll allow me to get the cutter head to roughly where I need it to be, and then I can make my first test passes and kind of fine tune things from there. Okay, let's start getting this a little closer. So, this is gonna move that mobile, uh, whatever, spindle in which is going to be setting the final width of the piece. So you have like two, I guess two cranks here. This is the final thickness of the piece. This would be the final width of the piece. Now one thing to keep in mind with this is that you cannot run a piece through here more than one time. So once the board goes through here, that's it. That board is done. It cannot be you, you can't make an adjustment around the board again and see what happens. You have to grab a new sample board because every time it goes through, this bottom cutter is going to shave something off of it. Okay, so after all of that, let's, uh, let's power it up and see, uh, see how that goes. So, bottom cutter. <laughs> So the next major thing with the machine is going to be to start throwing some test boards through it and getting those two cutters at the right heights so the tongue and grooves match and the top ends up nice and flush. Uh, before I do that, I want to get the dust collection hooked up. So I'm going to come off of my main trunk here. Right here is where it necks down to 6 inch. So I'm going to take this Y out and put a 90 on here. That, that 90 right there. I've got some other Ys and fittings from my collection of Nordfab stuff out in the barn. I'm going to hobble together what I can with what I have here, and I'll probably have to go and pick up a few small little things to finish up the uh, little install, this little temp, <laughs> temp dust collection trunk branch thingamabobber. Okay, we got the dust collection all plumbed up and ready to go. So that is uh, taken care of and off the list. So now we're gonna start running some test boards and getting those two side cutters at the correct elevation for the tongue and groove. So I'm gonna slam this thing through here. We'll cut it in half and then we'll take a look and see uh, how much the cutters need to be shimmed to make that uh, tongue and groove actually match up. For those of you wondering as far as timing goes, to get to this point, I have 14 hours into this machine. That's just setting up the machine, calibrating it, looking at it, figuring out what the heck I'm looking at, <laughs> and uh, all of that. That includes none of the time to process the wood to this point, just for machine setup and plumbing it into dust collection.
Okay, for my second test, I'm seeing that the tongue is just a little too high. It's contacting the top of the groove just a little bit, lift this one up. So we need to pick this one up a little bit more. So I've just been kind of playing around with the shims here. I have a seventh thou and a sixth thou shim, which seems to be the right height. So if I raise that one up a little bit, that seems like it's sliding in there a lot nicer. So throw some shims in and run the third test piece. Okay, with all those tests complete, I think I'm ready to start running some flooring. So I did make one quick change. So you probably noticed that when the board hit this roller here, it was uh, getting kicked and uh, there's a little bit of snipe happening. So what was, I think, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> what I think was happening is that these fences, because they have these two adjustment points and there's enough slop in them, they can do this kind of situation. So I just realigned the fence is here with a straight edge, so it should be parallel, but this was cocked kind of like this before. So as it was hitting this roller here, it was kicking the board over this way, creating a little dip, I think. We'll, we'll see if that theory works, but otherwise, if I have a little bit of snipe towards the front edge, I don't, it's not going to be a huge deal because these boards need to be trimmed still. They have end checks, so a lot of that should probably end up being removed anyway, but... All right, let's see what happens. I'm gonna run a few boards and uh, we will see how the first few look. And then once I'm happy with a few of these, we can go ahead and just, uh, just go, I guess. Finally, just go. So as I was running the boards, I noticed that the rollers weren't contacting the board anymore. And what had happened, and some of you warned me about this on Instagram, is that this cutter, the mobile one, likes to move. 
on its on its own. So what happened is it drifted out about a quarter of an inch. So my finished flat surface went from five and seven eighths and drifted towards six and an eighth. Uh, so I went ahead and I reset the cutter. I re-ran all of those boards with only that cutter spinning. Everything else was off except for power feed. I, uh, I really, really, really cranked down on the, the lock here. I guess it wasn't quite tight enough before, but it's really tight now. And I also put a, uh, a witness mark on here so I can watch it to see if this thing backs out or moves as things are progressing. After about 20 boards through, I, f I feel pretty confident that uh, I have figured out all the little, little quirks. <laughs> And I have about two hours left here before I take my kids to swimming lessons. So let's see if we can put a dent in the workbench and start uh, clearing off some of the space. Okay, good morning everyone. There is the stack from yesterday. That's how far I got in about three hours of actual finally just running it and not worrying about setting the machine up or something happening with it. So that's uh, three hours there. So that's the same amount of time it took me to edge joint every single board. <laughs> I got, I don't know, maybe 40% of, uh, of the six inch pile done. So. I'm just gonna get right into it today and uh, get going. Hopefully I can have the workbench cleared off before lunch or by lunch or around lunch, whatever. Lunch is happening. Regardless, lunch will happen.
Okay, I'm very excited to announce that we are down to the last row. Super excited to be here finally. <laughs> let's uh, let's run through this last row and then we'll start making some uh, narrow width planks. I'm very excited to announce that uh, the workbench is empty and we are done with the six inch wide flooring. I'm gonna reset, kind of reorganize my thoughts a little bit, start kind of digging through this and we'll, uh, we'll start making our second, second run and then probably our third and maybe even a fourth run kind of after that. Holy crap, finally. Okay, those are all sorted and prepped. So these are gonna be uh, I'm going to try and set these for four and an eighth wide. And then these will be a five inch wide face or maybe a little bit under there, four and seven eighths or something like that. But these will be a little bit wider than, uh, well, I guess it'd be an inch. <laughs> this is an inch smaller than this. This is an inch narrower than that stuff. So that's what I'm going to do now. Do the whole thing all over again. We'll reset the uh, mobile cutter thing and then uh, start running some flooring. Again. Okay, five inches done. Let's uh, reset again and get to the four inch stuff.
So here's the wood all stacked in the house. I have things sort of organized a little bit. So when I go to do the install, I have my short pieces over there and some lower grade stuff on the bottom. And this is all more like the premium best looking stuff. So it should help with the install a little bit. I have them stacked and stickered in here to help kind of mellow out their uh, moisture content. I was checking with the moisture meter as I was bringing things in and I'm seeing readings below four and up to about eight. I wanna get those eights to come down a little bit. So these are gonna sit in here and acclimate for a few weeks before I get into the install, but I have to get the area prepped anyway. So it all is gonna kind of work out well as far as timing goes. And fun fact, I made these stickers out of the old stair treads for the staircase that we removed, which used to be on the other side of that opening over there. So kind of a fun little tie-in of sorts. So big thank you to Matt and Andy for lending me the machine to make all of this flooring. That was super fun and very interesting to kind of experience and play with. If you missed the video that I did with Matt where he gave us a tour of uh, his operation, I'll leave you a link to that so you can definitely check that out. Now we have some actual flooring to get installed. I'm looking forward to actually getting the stuff in here and really transform that space into something that is uh, less, less of a construction site and more of a home. <laughs> So thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments on making the flooring or anything back in the shop or anything here with the home renovation remodel thing, my bobber, please feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, happy woodworking. It's wood.